Welcome to our Three Minute Therapy Weekly Podcast. I'm Dr. Michael Edelstein, clinical psychologist and author, and I'm here with my weekly co-host, Mick Berry, and we discuss issues related to REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, and Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy was devised by the brilliant psychologist Albert Ellis in the 1950s, and that created a revolution in the psychotherapy movement. Mick, would you want to uh, give a background of REBT, what it is, and the basic ideas? Well, it's, yeah, it was formulated originally by Albert Ellis in the 1950s. He originally called it rational therapy. Then he called it rational emotive therapy. And then he called it rational emotive behavior therapy. I came on board when it was called rational emotive therapy. And it cites that <clears throat> the way we think determines how we feel. And if we are having self-defeating feelings, if we're having mental disturbance such as depression, anxiety, rage, it's because we are thinking in an irrational way and even more specifically, unrealistic way. And he started to, Albert Ellis started to treat himself by just thinking more rationally, more realistically, and he found that his mental disturbances went away and he began treating people this way also by having them observe their thoughts, finding which thoughts are self-helping, which are self-defeating. And it gets very specific. The thoughts which are self-defeating are actually not that hard to identify. They are a demand, a must, a have to, a should. And if you are thinking in ways in which you are saying things must go a certain way, I have to have this go a certain way. We call these in REBT demands. And if you are thinking in demanding ways, you will disturb yourself mentally. And so REBT teaches people to dispute their demands, their musts, their shoulds. These are all synonymous terms for the same irrational thought to dispute them and to retain the desire that they have, such as I want to keep my job, but I don't have to keep my job, even though it's in my best interest to keep my job, even though I would be a lot better off, my family would be a lot better off, and even though my employer would be a lot better off. Nothing says I have to, the job must stay. My employer is free to make an idiotic decision. Okay, very good, very good. And uh, the only thing I would add to that, Mick, is not only does our thinking create our emotions, but it also creates our behaviors. So when we act in a certain way, it's because we have certain thinking that leads to those actions. Mick? I would say it encourages certain behavior because it's possible for me to feel suicidal but not commit suicide. For me to think that's an extreme or it's possible for me to feel rage but not exhibit the rage by throwing a coffee cup against the wall. So it does encourage us to and it's best to uh, not have the self-defeating thinking. But even if we do, REBT teaches us our behavior is still our choice. No matter what you are feeling or thinking, you still have a choice in what you choose to do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Also, another thing about must is it tends to lead to the opposite. So if I think I must have your approval, then if you look stern or you laugh, I easily assume you are disapproving of me. So I must are a problem there. If I have a must, I must have a guarantee the plane isn't going to crash. And then if there's the slightest turbulence, I'm more likely to assume the plane is about to crash. So that's another problem with must. Today, we're going to be discussing REBT and cynicism. And uh, cynicism is normally the tendency to assume the worst in people and in situations and assuming negative intentions in others as opposed to being skeptical having an open mind and looking for evidence being more of a questioner a scientific thinker 
rather than being a cynical and assuming the worst is going to happen. Uh, and that comes from certain musts, as Mick was saying. Uh, there are musts that cause cynicism. I must not be deceived. And if someone deceives me, this is awful, terrible, and horrible. Others must always be truthful and reasonable. And if they're not, I can't stand it. And uh, my life must go well. And if it's not, this is awful and terrible. Mick? Yeah, I was going to say with cynicism, I do believe that there is a demand inherent in cynicism. And some people who aren't that familiar with REBT, and even some people who practice REBT, might not find the demand. But when we're having a mental disturbance, there is a demand there. It can always be found. The more you practice REBT, the easier it is to find them. And I have, I pulled up a definition of cynicism just on Google. And it's an inclination to believe that people are motivated by purely selfish interest, skepticism, though skepticism isn't necessarily cynicism, but then another is a general distrust of others' motives and intentions, and the belief that people are generally selfish, greedy, and dishonest. And I think this comes, tell me if you think I'm on to something, I think this comes from people thinking, People must be honest. People must be trustworthy. And because there's no guarantee that I mu that people are trustworthy, I demand that people must be trustworthy. And since they're not, that means, or this, since I don't have a guarantee that they're going to be trustworthy, that means that they're rotten to the core and you can count on people doing the wrong thing. Yes, and part of a must is I run the universe and I control you, therefore people must be the way I want them to be, trustworthy and rational. And um, that is total fiction, obviously. So it means being, accepting the fact you're an imperfect human, others are imperfect, so they will act imperfectly, and they have a perfect right to act imperfectly because that's in their nature. Nick? And we prefer that they don't. We want to do everything we can so that people do act in ways in which we can trust them, but we don't have complete control over anybody else. And in fact, what we have the most control over is ourself, but REBT also says, and I agree with it, that we cannot be 100% rational. We can try to be 100% rational, but if we demand ourselves to be 100% rational, that's one of the craziest thoughts we can have. Uh, I did wanna say another thing about cynicism. One thing I've found, this isn't <clears throat> a quote by somebody who practices REBT per se, but I do think it's a very rational thought. There's a man named John Carroll who used to write a an article <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, on the last page of the San Francisco Chronicle every day. And he said, cynicism is always a chump's game. And I find that that sentence inspires me not to be cynical. <clears throat> you don't want to be a chump. Yeah, well, does that make sense to you? And I think what he would say, to put it in REBT terms, is cynicism is self-defeating. Yes, cynicism is self-defeating because it's not reasonable, it's not rational, it's not realistic. So if you are cynical, you'll get in trouble with reality. Nick? And I think another reason that people turn to cynicism, tell me if you think this is correct, they've got a thought, I can't stand it if this person isn't trustworthy. Therefore, I'm going to assume they're not trustworthy and expect them to not be trustworthy so that I won't be surprised because I can't stand it if I'm disappointed. That's right. Exactly. And, yeah. and so, sometimes when people are disappointed, then they're more likely to conclude, that was awful that I was disappointed. Therefore, I must never be disappointed again. Mick? And I wanted to say something about the phrase, I can't stand a situation. There is a demand in there because if I'm saying I can't stand it, I'm saying I must have it be otherwise. But if I say, well, I'll be able to stand it, I'm going to stand it no matter what happens. In fact, you taught this to me 
I'm going to be standing it, even if I'm fuming and raging about the situation, I'll still be standing it. I just won't be standing it in a very self-helping way. Exactly. Yes. Okay, Mick, uh, that covers it from my end on cynicism and REBT as approach to cynicism. Mick, did you have further things to say? Well, I also think that uh, it's very useful to know that there are people that are best not to be trusted and that REBT would encourage us to associate ourselves with people that we can trust. So just because uh, we uh, just because somebody could possibly be trusted, that doesn't mean that they are trustworthy. So it's important to live in the practical world and to surround ourselves with as many people as we can that uh, we can trust and that do have our our best interests in mind rather than just being selfish because there are some people that are selfish and won't care about us in the least bit. Yeah, and uh, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, unless there's a change, like in someone's thinking, then their future behavior could change. But in general, as you're saying, that if uh, someone has been uh, acting untrustworthy in the past, it's most likely that they're not to be trusted in the future. Probably, Mick. And I was going to say a best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. I think that applies to RABT also because, you know, in my experience, I used to have a very big problem with depression. I no longer do. So past experiences by applying RABT to my irrational thoughts, I eliminate the depression. So I'm confident that I'll be able to do that in the future. Would you say that's an example of the past being a good predictor of the future? Uh, yeah, past being, being a good predictor of the future, but not a perfect predictor of the future. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. that's a good point. How is it that REBT would not be effective? I suppose it wouldn't be effective if you want to have a guarantee that will never be irrational. REBT does not claim to have the capability to eliminate all irrationality. Right. You remind me of a uh, idea for a future podcast. When is REBT effective and when is it not effective? Yeah, well, so, I think, okay, yeah. we'll leave that for a future podcast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I'll tell them to you next week or something. Okay, good, good. Okay, thanks, Mick. I'm here with Mick Berry. I'm Dr. Michael Edelstein, clinical psychologist. And thank you, Chris Rossini, our tech engineer. Comment below if you have thoughts, questions, or you'd like to uh, suggest subjects or volunteer and be on the program from time to time. As you might have seen, we've had guests on the program. Give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the Three Minute Therapy podcast to do what, Mick? To stay on the rational side of life.